The new school year is here. Visit queenslibrary.org to see all of our back to school programs and giveaways and to read our guide with helpful tips on family communication, book lists, and more. Ban Books Week is from September 18th through September 24th, and we are celebrating the books that dare us to think deeply, opening our minds to new perspectives, cultures, surroundings, and beyond. Participate in our sweepstakes online or in person, or visit our website to view our top 100 most popular banned and challenged books in circulation during the past decade. A QPL card is your passport to over 5.3 million books, movies, and other media, over 19,000 classes and events per year, over 5,000 computer workstations, and so much more. Enjoy these wonderful benefits by applying for a library card on our website or at your local library. Welcome to Queen's Public Library's talk with Eduardo Ballerini and Matthew Spector about F. Scott Fitzgerald's 1925 masterpiece, The Great Gatsby. Almost 100 years after its publication, it's hard to imagine anyone not knowing the famous plot. Jay Gatsby, a self-made millionaire living in a mansion on Long Island's West Egg, becomes a staggering success to impress and win the love of Daisy Buchanan, a former lover he obsesses over who lives in East Egg. Their tragic saga is observed and narrated by Nick Carraway, a cousin of Daisy's. Fitzgerald's third novel, After This Side of Paradise and the Beautiful and the Damned, was originally going to be titled Among Ash Heaps and Millionaires, or Tramalchio and West Egg, among several others. This original cover by Francis Cougat so impressed Fitzgerald that he incorporated elements from it into his story. Perhaps, it is said, inspiring Fitzgerald's celestial eye. Hi. I'm Brian Alessandro. For those of you who don't know me, I have written for Interview Magazine, Newsday, Pink, Huffington Post, and have recently adapted Edmund White's A Boy's Own Story into a graphic novel for Top Shelf Productions, which will be released this December. Additionally, I co-edited Fever Spores, The Queer Reclamation of William S. Burroughs, an anthology of essays and interviews about Burroughs for Rebel Satori Press. I'm also the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the literary journal, The New Engagement. My first novel, The Unmentionable Mon, was published in 2015 by Karen Press, and my first feature film, Afghan Hound was produced by Mary Media in 2011. It is currently streaming on Plex, Tubi, and Amazon. My new novel, Performer Non Grata, will be released in April 2023 by Rebel Satori Press. Culture Connection, curated by Daniel Zaleski and now in its ninth year at the Queen's Public Library, is proud to present international artists from emerging talent to award-winning masters. These disciplines include music, theater, author talks, and film. Now expanding into a virtual format, Culture Connection is currently reaching a global audience. Eduardo Ballerini is an actor, a narrator, a writer, and a director. He is best known on screen for his roles as the hot-headed chef in the cult classic Dinner Rush and as junkie Corky Caparelle on The Sopranos. He will soon be returning to the screens in the upcoming series Retreat for Hulu. Behind the mic, Eduardo is a two-time winner and three-time nominee of the Audio Publishers Association Best Male Narrator Award and the voice of over almost 400 audiobooks from classics by Tolstoy, Stendhal, Walt Whitman, Jack London, Dostoevsky, and others, to modern bestsellers by Jess Walter, Amor Towles, Richard Powers, Andre Asaman, James Patterson, David Baldacci, and others. In 2019, Eduardo recorded the unabridged Hebrew Bible. This led to a profile in the New York Times, which called him, understandably, the voice of God. Matthew Spector is an author of fiction, the novels American Dream Machine and That Summertime Sound, and the nonfiction books The Sting, The Golden Hour, and most recently, Always Crashing in the Same Car. He has also contributed to the New York Times, The Paris Review, The Believer, Tin House, Vogue, and GQ. He's a founding editor of the Los Angeles Review of Books. Thank you both, Eduardo and Matthew, for joining us this evening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us, Brian. So the way this program is going to go is Matthew and I will have a discussion about The Great Gatsby and Eduardo will pop in periodically to read passages. 
So, Eduardo, you could take a break backstage until we beckon you. <laughs> uh, and Matthew, before, I, before I go, I have to say that the cover, which is the cover of the edition I had in high school when I first read this, always freaked me out. <laughs> it's kind of creepy, right? It's kind of weird. And with that, that I will uh, step back. <laughs> right, you in a few minutes. Yeah. Matthew, so The Great Gatsby will celebrate its centennial in about two and a half years. Um, it's as popular today as it's ever been. Why do you think it endures? Um, I have a feeling that I'll probably be hammering this note uh, on a couple of occasions, but you know, I, I think the, the a key, one key to the to the book's kind of abiding popularity, aside from its um, you know, aside from its evergreen American themes, is the the ambivalence and the conflictedness that that Fitzgerald um, brings to it. Um, it is a book that I have, you know, like 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 probably almost everybody who's who's listening to this that I first read in high school, um, that I've probably read eight or ten times since then, um, you know, and it's never the same book twice, um, you know. It's always and it, it's not just you know, and it's so short. It's 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 really yeah. a book that you that you um, you know that that one retains and remembers. Um, yeah, it's a long but, novella, really. but its it's meaning, its meaning is never the same. Right. It's like a Rorschach in that yeah. you're always projecting whatever you need to project onto it, depending on where you are in your life. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's just not a book that 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 one can ever one can ever settle. And yet it's an amazingly seductive and and, um, you know, it's, it's a book that 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 one that appears to digest very easily, even though one is never fully clear on what it means. <laughs> so your point about first discovering it in high school, I actually was on the other side of it. I taught the novel about 10 years ago to high school students, uh -huh. and they were, to use your words, seduced by the promise of glamour and wealth and power, despite the fact that the book is a cautionary tale. Do you think that there's a risk in new readers projecting a misguided lesson onto it? I mean, uh, I want to be kind of perverse and say I hope so. Um, <laughs> I, I think in many respects, it's it's that that's that's kind of what I'm what I'm talking about and gesturing at here. I do think that 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 um, seductiveness and that that way that Fitzgerald himself is is half seduced by it. Um, there's what he wants to mean, um, and there's what he actually means, and there's you know there's a disjunct between those things and a. And a um, you know, an, an unclarity, you know, it, it is a very um, seductive portrait. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, that's which is just an, such an enormous part of the book's, you know, not just the book's power, but the book's the book's actual meaning. Um, and uh, and so, you know, I, I think, yeah, of course there is. And I think certainly when I first read, I mean, it was not the first Fitzgerald I read. I read his first book, This Side of Paradise, which uh, was a very important book to me when I was, 14, it was, you know, kind of a book that, that flipped a switch and made me want to become a writer. Um, and it's a, it's a bad book. Um, but it is, it is, or at least it's, it's not a successful book. I think it's, I think it's a book with a kind of wonderful opening and a, and a kind of ridiculous latter half. Um, but it, it is, um, you know, it, it too is a book that, it, that it, I would say much more than Gatsby, a book that's sort of, um, uh, less able to resist the lure, the sort of more glamorous lures of, of you know, certain kinds of, um, you know, wealth and, and class, you know. Do you think, Matthew, do you think The Great Gatsby is his best book? I'm not sure. Um, I, I think it's probably his most, his most complete book, his most finished. Um, you know, there are, I, 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 um, I really love uh, the last tycoon, the love of the last tycoon, right. and that was that was incomplete. Wasn't it was, it? yeah. And it's you know book. it's beautiful even in its incomplete book. Yeah. It's a it's a sort of why uh, I'm looking for a better word than wise. I hate when we praise books for their their <laughs> wisdom, but there is something um, sagacious, <laughs> much softer about it, much much more. And you know, and I don't mean softer in the sense of of you know squishier. I mean there's there's a there's a quality to it that just feels like he's really kind of reached a much deeper uh, accommodation with some of the things that he um, you know, wrote about his entire life. So before we move on, I'd like for Eduardo to pop back in and just read the first couple of pages for our listeners to give them a flavor, to give them a taste. All right, chapter one. In my younger and more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my mind ever since. Whenever you feel like criticizing anyone, he told me, 
Just remember that all the people in this world haven't had the advantages that you've had. He didn't say any more, but we've always been unusually communicative in a reserved way, and I understood that he meant a great deal more than that. In consequence, I'm inclined to reserve all judgments, a habit that has opened up many curious natures to me and also made me the victim of not a few veteran bores. The abnormal mind is quick to detect and attach itself to this quality when it appears in a normal person. And so it came about that in college I was unjustly accused of being a politician because I was privy to the secret griefs of wild unknown men. Most of the confidences were unsought. Frequently I have feigned sleep, preoccupation, or a hostile levity when I realized by some unmistakable sign that an intimate revelation was quivering on the horizon. For the intimate revelations of young men, or at least the terms in which they express them, are usually plagiaristic and marred by obvious suppressions. Reserving judgments is a matter of infinite hope. I am still a little afraid of missing something if I forget that, as my father snobbishly suggested, and I snobbishly repeat, a sense of the fundamental decencies is parceled out unequally at birth. And after boasting this way of my tolerance, I come to the admission that it has a limit. Conduct may be founded on the hard rock or the wet marshes, but after a certain point, I don't care what it's founded on. When I came back from the East last autumn, I felt that I wanted the world to be in uniform and at a sort of moral attention forever. I wanted no more riotous excursions with privileged glimpses into the human heart. Only Gatsby, the man who gives his name to this book, was exempt from my reaction. Gatsby, who represented everything for which I have an unaffected scorn. If personality is an unbroken series of successful gestures, then there was something gorgeous about him, some heightened sensitivity to the promises of life, as if he were related to one of those intricate machines that register earthquakes 10,000 miles away. This responsiveness had nothing to do with that flabby impressionability which is dignified under the name of the creative temperament. It was an extraordinary gift for hope, a romantic readiness such as I have never found in any other person and which it is not likely I shall ever find again. No, Gatsby turned out all right at the end. It is what preyed on Gatsby what foul dust floated in the wake of his dreams that temporarily closed out my interest in the abortive sorrows and short-winded elations of men. My family have been prominent well-to-do people in this middle western city for three generations. The Carraways are something of a clan, and we have a tradition that we're descended from the Dukes of Buclic. But the actual founder of my line was my grandfather's brother, who came here in 51, sent a substitute to the Civil War, and started the wholesale hardware business that my father carries on today. I never saw this great uncle, but I'm supposed to look like him. With special reference to the rather hard-boiled painting that hangs in my father's office, I graduated from New Haven in 1915, just a quarter of a century after my father, and a little later I participated in that delayed Teutonic migration known as the Great War. I enjoyed the counter raid so thoroughly that I came back restless, Instead of being the warm center of the world, the Middle West now seemed like the ragged edge of the universe. So I decided to go east and learn the bond business. Everybody I knew was in the bond business, so I supposed it could support one more single man. All my aunts and uncles talked it over as if they were choosing a prep school for me, and finally said, why, y yes, yes, with very grave, hesitant faces. Father agreed to finance me for a year, and after various delays, I came east permanently, I thought, in the spring of 22. Beautifully mm -hmm. done. Thank you, Eduardo. Yeah. Amazing. Matthew would really be a beautiful reader. Um, Matthew, would you respond to that opening? You know, what, what goes through your mind when you hear? Not yeah. necessarily everyone's reading, which we know is wonderful. No, no, it, it's, 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 it's an incredible, it's an incredible passage. And it's, 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 you know, obviously, it, it it's it's all sort of prefatory in a way, right? It's it's it, it, but it's a, it's a it's a remarkable and also I think deeply frustrating piece of p positioning. I mean, frustrating in, in kind of the best possible way. You know, he 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 starts off by talking about his his gift for suspending judgment, um, and then proceeds to to uh, judge just about everything, right? Yeah. About his his uh, you know his snobbishness, his 
scorn for Gatsby, which is which is just one of those lines that has always bothered me because it's like nowhere else in the manuscript does he demonstrate anything resembling uh, sc scorn exactly. It's a very you know it's a it's a very I mean it's I I don't. Do you think it was intentional? Do you think it was clumsiness on the part of Fitzgerald? No, I certainly don't think it's clumsiness. I think it's I think it's a kind of um, I think it's a uh, there's a certain kind of doubleness um, that that's going to shadow Nick through the through the whole manuscript. Uh, you know? And and the contradictory nature of it, I think, is important in, in literature yeah. and in fiction. You know, characters are most interesting when they're contradictory. Yeah, um, of course, they're only interesting. They're when only they're interesting when they're contradictory. Exactly. Uh, what what does Fitzgerald in this book say about class and classism? I know that's a very broad subject, but what, yeah, what, yeah. Mind, what, what do you think he's trying to explore? If not, I think the best fiction writers don't necessarily say a specific thing, but they start yes. to ask a lot of questions, right? So, yeah, yeah. I, I I think I mean I think he's saying I think there are, there are many many things that he that he that he has to say, and and obviously his view of. Um, old money <laughs> as it appears in this book is pretty is pretty brutal um you know um as he will ultimately say of of tom and daisy you know they, they were careless people right um and he will he will depict them as as um you know in in, in terms that are that are um understandably quite awful right <laughs> um and and so um it's clear that this is that that is something for which he he um you know, uh, has no great uh, reverence, <laughs> and um, and uh, you know, and 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 I think any reader of the book will will understand that that he's not um, he's not a great enthusiast of um, you know the sort of existing American uh, class arrangement. Um, but it is also true that you know that that Gatsby in his um, you know, in his graspingness, <laughs> in his in his desire to 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 pass yeah, well, yeah. for, for a, a person of stature, um, you know that this is both something that he, you know, that I, I think that's the thing, right? When he says, "For which I feel unaffected scorn," that is that is what he's referring to is is Gatsby's, um, you know, kind of aspiringness to to something and his presentation of himself as something he is not. Um, but I also think that that is something that that Fitzgerald views with much more um, ambivalence and and um, you know and, and I would even say you know that that's that that's the part of the book that is that is probably the most the aspect of the book that might be most personal for him, um, right? It's no time getting to it. I mean, it's it's, yes. it's sort of that you're you know you you're thrown into the deep end almost immediately, and then yes, uh, yes. Not, and it's not that it gets any more shallow. It just it continues to get deep. You just yes. you're you're better by the time you get there <laughs> yeah exactly. but but the passage that eduardo just read i mean there's so much in it there's also that line which is which has haunted me forever when he says when i came back from the east i you know i wanted the world to stand at a sort of moral attention forever which sounds amazing and yet also feels kind of deeply disproportionate to what to what actually unfolds in the story um and i think in a certain way like what that, I mean, the reason that line has resonance is because of, you know, because of World, World War One. you know, um, yeah. there is some sense that, that at the moment this book was written, you know, it, it, that, that desire happens to, happens to chime with something that, that one would have wanted in a much greater sense, you know, and, and I think oh, yeah. the sort of specter of the war as it falls across this novel, it, it you know, it, it's coded into this novel in, in so many different ways. Um, I, I think that, really uh, sort of very poignant observation that, yeah, there's this specter that sort of looms over the story and over the jazz age itself, right? right. Coming off of World War One, just a few, by a few years. Yeah. And what, so we're close to a hundred years later. Right. In, in what ways is the book still very relevant, even urgent today? Well, I mean, I think that we are still, this is still a country of people who are endlessly presenting themselves as what they are not. <laughs> think it's um, gonna make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and and I think that's that's certainly you know. Um, I I don't. I I really am always a little reluctant to sort of frame things through the lens of uh, of uh, you know Donald Trump or, or or recent presidency. But but that's kind of a perfect example of <laughs> you know the line the line between a Jay Gatsby and a Donald Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, even though I think Gatsby is a is a 
you know, figure worthy of, of attention and, and sympathy, uh, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. much more, a much more complex and tragic figure than the other could ever be. But, you know, it's like that is that is a, a central that remains a, a central tenet of American life, you know, the, the, the notion of self-invention and of, of um, you know, creating a narrative about yourself that isn't true. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, between a man who sort of claims, you know, I'm an Oxford man. And someone who says, uh, I never told anybody this, but the queen knighted me. Uh, you know, it's it's pretty simple. Um, it's what's American and really sort of constructing a persona. Yes. You know? it's, yes. And reconstructing it and reconstructing it and reinventing yeah. it. Yeah. Um, before we progress, I'd like to bring Eduardo back to read another passage. Wonderful. I lived at West Egg, the, well, the less fashionable of the two though this is a most superficial tag to express the bizarre and not a little sinister contrast between them. My house was at the very tip of the egg, only 50 yards from the sound, and squeezed between two huge places that rented for 12 or 15,000 a season. The one on my right was a colossal affair by any standard. It was a factual imitation of some hôtel de ville in Normandy, with a tower on one side, spanking new under a thin beard of raw ivy, and a marble swimming pool, and more than 40 acres of lawn and garden. It was Gatsby's mansion, or rather, as I didn't know Mr. Gatsby, it was a mansion inhabited by a gentleman of that name. My own house was an eyesore, but it was a small eyesore, and it had been overlooked, so I had a view of the water, a partial view of my neighbor's lawn, and the consoling proximity of millionaires, all for $80 a month. Across the Courtesy Bay, the white palaces of fashionable East Egg glittered along the water, and the history of the summer really begins on the evening I drove over there to have dinner with the Tom Buchanans. Daisy was my second cousin once removed, and I'd known Tom in college, and just after the war I spent two days with them in Chicago. Her husband, among various physical accomplishments, had been one of the most powerful ends that ever played football at New Haven. A national figure, in a way, one of those men who reach such an acute limited excellence at 21 that everything afterwards savors of anticlimax. His family were enormously wealthy. Even in college, his freedom with money was a matter for reproach. But now he'd left Chicago and come east in a fashion that rather took your breath away. For instance, he would brought down a string of polo ponies from Lake Forest. It was hard to realize that a man in my own generation was wealthy enough to do that. Why they came east, I don't know. They'd spent a year in France for no particular reason and then drifted here and there unrestfully wherever people played polo and were rich together. This was a permanent move, said Daisy over the telephone, but I didn't believe it. I had no sight into Daisy's heart, but I felt that Tom would drift on forever seeking a little wistfully for the dramatic turbulence of some irrecoverable football game. And so it happened that on a warm, windy evening, I drove over to East Egg to see two old friends whom I scarcely knew at all. Their house was even more elaborate than I expected, a cheerful red and white Georgian colonial mansion overlooking the bay. The lawn started at the beach and ran toward the front door for a quarter of a mile, jumping over sundials and brick walks and burning gardens, finally when it reached the house, drifting up the side in bright vines as though from the momentum of its run. The front was broken by a line of French windows, glowing now with reflected gold and wide open to the warm, windy afternoon, and Tom Buchanan, in riding clothes, was standing with his legs apart on the front porch. He had changed since his New Haven days. Now he was a sturdy, straw-haired man of thirty, with a rather hard mouth and a supercilious manner. Two shining, arrogant eyes had established dominance over his face, and gave him the appearance of always leaning aggressively forward. Not even the effeminate swank of his riding clothes could hide the enormous power of that body. He seemed to fill those glistening boots until he strained the top lacing, and you could see a great pack of muscle shifting when his shoulder moved under his thin coat. It was a body capable of enormous leverage, a cruel body. That's great. Thank you, Eduardo. <laughs> yeah. What um, what, can you maybe say a little bit, Matthew, about his power of description? Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about the the description of that lawn, you know, running up the, um, 
you know, running and jumping over, you know, it's, and, and it's a lawn, the most static object imaginable. And, and I, and I do think that there are many passages in this book that have this kind of almost like volcanic descriptive vigor to, to an extent that it is, it is almost impossible to read literally. Um, you know, there's a, another passage that I always think about all the time is a passage in which, uh, you know, when he first meets Jordan Baker and he comes in and it describes the, the, the curtains ballooning and the, you know, I think that's the next passage, actually. Yeah, yeah, we, we'll get to that passage, I suppose. But it, it you know, there's a, um, a vitality and, and a, a sort of sense of c c constant motion, um, you know, um, imparted even to things that aren't moving. Um, and and it's, it's you know, you, you see it in, in all kinds of, you know, I, I think almost all of the, the, the books kind of um, descriptive passages have that quality and you you see it in the description of Tom Tom Buchanan too where it's you know describing the kind of volcanic power of his body and his shoulders and the movement of his muscles but it's also just describing him standing on the on the porch yeah not not moving uh, do you think it's the thing he does best yeah maybe <laughs> i mean it's so it's so remarkable and it's so it's so distinctive and it and it you know again i think just you know, this book, like, like so much great literature, but, but this book especially, you know, kind of operates through this, this unbearable tension of, of opposites, mm -hmm. right. Of, of sort of affection and disgust and, you know, just these, these, um, you know, these forces that are, that are, that are irreconcilable, um, somehow finding their way into a, into a kind of moment of, of equilibrium or into a, a representation that offers equilibrium. It's kind of like a magical thing, honestly, what he does. It's a, it's an incredible sleight of hand with just yeah. enormous talent. Um, the Great Gatsby is semi-autobiographical. Semi is it not that Cheryl based it partly on his affair with the Chicago socialite Geneva King? Geneva King, yeah. Yeah, that's how I've always understood it, right? That that he had dated a a, a, a woman that, that, you know, who was wealthy yeah. <laughs> and whose parents didn't approve of, of you know, um, this nice but penniless little writer boy from from <laughs> Minnesota, um, and that that became the the um, the uh, the engine, you know, for for the story of, of Daisy and and of Gatsby's, uh, you know, love for her. Um, so yeah, it is it is a you know the the greatest uh, uh, you know I don't know if revenge fantasy is quite the right word, but you know. There's an element of that, though, for sure, which yeah. which makes it especially uh, fascinating. The novel actually did not perform well commercially, right? Fitzgerald died at only 44 years old in 1940, believing yeah. himself a failure to yeah. be forgotten. When did it really gain major attention? During World War II, was it? And, and then during, during World War II, it began. Um, I think the book was sent. It, there was a it, because the book was so short. It was sent to to soldiers. I think right that there was a there was a right sort of great outpouring of copies to be sent to soldiers and soldiers apparently responded to it because of the, the longing for the, the women, you know, that, that they, you know, were for their, you know, girls at home that they had cared sure. for. Um, so it, it, you know, that I think kind of pushed it back into circulation and then um, Lionel Trilling and other people started writing uh, in appreciation of it. This is 20 years after. Yes. Yeah. And then it eventually weren't worked its way into high schools, right? It became part yeah, of the exactly. Yeah. And then, of course, once it does that, it's... Yeah, I think that that happened starting in the 60s, right? So, so another 20 years before that. Yeah. Okay, let's bring Eduardo back for yet another passage. I began to like New York, the racy, adventurous feel of it at night, and the satisfaction that the constant flicker of men and women and machines gives to the restless eye. I like to walk up Fifth Avenue and pick out romantic women from the crowd and imagine that in a few minutes I was going to enter into their lives, and no one would ever know or disapprove. Sometimes in my mind I followed them to their apartments on the corners of hidden streets, and they turned and smiled back at me before they faded through a door into warm darkness. At the enchanted metropolitan twilight, I felt a haunting loneliness sometimes, and felt it in others, poor young clerks who loitered in front of windows waiting until it was time for a solitary restaurant dinner, young clerks in the dusk, wasting the most poignant moments of night and life. Again at eight o'clock, when the dark lanes of the forties were five deep with throbbing taxi cabs bound for the theater district, 
I felt a sinking in my heart. Forms leaned together in the taxis as they waited, and voices sang, and there was laughter from unheard jokes, and lighted cigarettes outlined unintelligible seventy gestures inside, imagining that I, too, was hurrying toward gaiety and sharing their intimate excitement. I wished them well. For a while, I lost sight of Jordan Baker, and then in midsummer, I found her again. At first, I was flattered to go to places with her because she was a golf champion and everyone knew her name. Then it was something more. I wasn't actually in love, but I felt a sort of tender curiosity. The bored, haughty face that she turned to the world concealed something. Most affectations conceal something eventually, even though they don't in the beginning. And one day I found what it was. We were on a house party together up in Warwick. She left a borrowed car out in the rain with the top down and then lied about it. And suddenly I remembered the story about her that had eluded me that night at Daisy's. At her first big golf tournament, there was a row that nearly reached the newspapers, a suggestion that she had moved her ball from a bad lie in the semi-final round. The thing approached the proportions of a scandal, then died away. A caddy retracted his statement, and the only other witness admitted that he might have been mistaken. The incident and the name had remained together in my mind. Jordan Baker instinctively avoided clever, shrewd men, and now I saw that this was because she felt safer on a plane where any divergence from a code would be, taught, would be thought impossible. She was incurably dishonest. She wasn't able to endure being at a disadvantage, and given this unwillingness, I suppose she'd begun dealing in subterfuges when she was very young in order to keep that cool, insolent smile turned to the world and yet satisfy the demands of her hard, jaunty body. It made no difference to me. Dishonesty in a woman is a thing you never blame deeply. I was casually sorry, and then I forgot. It was on that same house party that we had a curious conversation about driving a car. It started because she passed so close to some workmen that our fender flicked a button on one man's coat. Hmm. Great, thank you, Eduardo. Yeah. Matthew, what can you say about Fitzgerald's psychological complexity? Um, well, I mean, it, again, that I love that passage in it. it you know, it, that it starts with that. You know, him kind of wandering around Manhattan, and it, it strikes me that you know that that positioning, which is a you know that passage, seems to sort of run parallel to a lot of other aspects of the of the book. You know, it's, it almost um, you know I think of that almost as like a, a a kind of minor key passage that 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 miniaturizes and reflects back, you know, mm. all the, or many of the larger themes and movements of the book. You know, you, you have the, him kind of looking at, you know, taking in Manhattan as a solitary observer, which feels like a sort of um, inversion of the, the Milk of Wonder passage where Gatsby is, uh, you know, there, there's that famous passage where he talks about him kissing Daisy. Sure. Um, and, um, and the, um, you know, Jordan Baker, of course, the, the portrait of her as a, um, a liar <laughs> and a, a, a cheat of sorts. And of course her, um, you know, hitting the, the buttons of one of the workmen, which, which, you know, one could say sort of, you know, anticipates the, the climax of the book. Sure. Um, and it's such a, such an incredible, and again, kind of an impossible image, right? Um, you know, if you, if you really try to work that out, you think, really? <laughs> there's a, there's there really so. I hate to use this adjective because it's so it's overused these days, but there really it was a cinematic quality to, of course. to the writing. Yeah, you know? but I think you know when you talk about this sort of cinematic complexity, it, it again it has to do with that that um, wonderful positioning of of Nick as a as a not just an observer, but as a as a sort of um, you know as a, as a as a sort of almost like an echo chamber or or a, a sounding area for for the you know, the, the people and the things that he's looking at. I mean, that, that calls back, you know, the, the, the way he portrays himself at the beginning of the book, which oh, again, seems a little double to me, but you know, when he, when he talks about how he's, he's always been, you know, um, you know, privy to having people, you know, confess things to him or tell him things or, you know, the, the outbursts of wild unknown men or whatever, whatever that wonderful phrase is that he uses at the beginning. Um, you know, and, and and I think the tension between Nick as as someone who's, 
merely registering and speculating, uh, and um, you know, and and between him as a as a as a participant in the story, to what extent he is, um, and as a you know, as both an intimate observer and as someone who is implicated by it, um, you know, all of the complexity lives in that framing. I'd like to shift gears for a moment. Can we talk about the accusations of the book being anti-Semitic? Uh -huh. Can you speak to this controversy and, and help us make sense of it? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing because it's obviously the the, the portrait of Meyer Wolfsheim is as, is as close to the book, is as close to um, burlesque, let's say, as the book will ever get i mean you know the 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 sort of way he connection right he says he, he always pronounces the word connection as if it is with g's so it's it's sort of you know there's a there, there there's sort of a cartoonish quality to his accent a sort of um i mean cartoonish might be too gentle a word but you know the the the, mo the human molars that are his cufflinks um you know it's it's um it's it's hard to uh read that portrait and not walk away from it feeling like, you know, well, this is pretty, pretty ugly anti-Semitic stuff. And, um, uh, but it's a strange thing. I mean, I, I know, you know, we'll, we'll, we can, because, I, because I, um, I think of that portrait as being anti-Semitic. I don't think of Fitzgerald as being, um, him, you know, himself a sort of raging anti-Semite, um, you know, I, I certainly know that he was he was very early. He was quite vocal in his, um, you know, alarm about about Hitler. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, and, and... Could, go ahead, Matthew. I'm sorry. Yeah. There's yeah. Thing with fiction that I think is always so tricky. And I don't know if this was the case with Fitzgerald, is that when you're trying to you're not writing in the first person necessarily. Right. But you're yeah. trying to capture a sensibility or a point of view of a character who might. Exactly. Bigoted, uh, a bigoted perspective, and right. you want to approximate without being too clumsy or on the nose about saying this is so and so's point of view. Um, yes. It can be misread sometimes that it is the author who feels right. a certain way right. about a certain person. Right. That could be the case here. I don't know. I, I, th I, I mean, I, I do think so. I think of you know, I always think about the passage in the crack up, um, mm -hmm. the later essay, the, the crack up, where he talks about you know, I grew up with only the most vague racial prejudices, right? And you're like, well, vague racial prejudices are still, <laughs> yeah. they are what they are. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, without a doubt, I think this book, um, you know, uh, you know, that has its, has its dicey moments while at the same time, not that, you know, it doesn't, um, you know, I, I think that there's a, that there's a sort of contrapuntal aspect to that here as well, right? Mm -hmm. When 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 he gets you know it's it's very obvious when he's making uh, Tom Buchanan you know talk about you know race science and and books and you know all this kind of really horrendous stuff it's very obvious that that Fitzgerald is framing that in a way that is that is meant to be extremely disapproving mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that that his own uh, or that that other forms of, of you know anti-Semitism or racism don't enter the text anyway. I'd like to shift gears again. Um, the Valley of the Ashes is now Flushing Meadows, Corona Park in Queens, very close to where I grew up, actually. Uh -huh. uh, and it's also where the characters George and Myrtle Wilson live and symbolizes industrialization. I think of D.H. Lawrence and his concerns about humans being removed from their nature and sold by technology. How is The Great Gatsby about environmentalism in this respect? When you, when you had first brought that up to me, it, I, I, it struck me that I had never... I never viewed it in that light and, um, and nor have I ever, nor have I ever, nor did I even know I'm not, I'm, I, I have lived in New York for periods of time, but I don't think I knew where that, that the Valley of Ashes was, um, you know, was located. But I, but I do think, you know, that to, to me, I've always read that passage as being much more about, about World War One. that, that again is a, is a kind of way of, of, um, uh, you know, figurating <laughs> the, 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 the trenches and the, you know, the sort of um, awful, you know, purgatorial, hellish, uh, you know, environment there. <laughs> you know, that's interesting. I like I, I like that reading of it as well. And finally, before we bring Eduardo back for a fourth reading, I'd like to ask you what you think Fitzgerald was trying to 
get at in his uh, posing of self self-made wealth with inherited wealth and, and what that says about the American dream generally. Uh, yeah, again, I mean, I think this is an area where, um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's interesting. I, once again, I don't think he draws, I don't think he's drawn, drawing a single conclusion, right? I mean, obviously, the way that Gatsby has made his wealth, <laughs> bootlegging, uh, <laughs> you know, is, is itself very, very, very interesting and, and lends itself to um, you know, I'll put it this way. Um, not only would this be a very different book, I would, I would argue that, that it might not be much of a book at all if, uh, you know, if, if Gatsby had, had made a bunch of money, but made it, uh, you know, uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, that, that wouldn't be very, that wouldn't just wouldn't be nearly as compelling. Right. I agree. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, Eduardo, whenever you're ready. He talked a lot about the past, and I gathered that he wanted to recover something, some idea of himself, perhaps, that had gone into loving Daisy. His life had been confused and disordered since then, but if he could once return to a certain starting place and go over it all slowly, he could find out what that thing was. One autumn night, five years before, they had been walking down the street when the leaves were falling, and they came to a place where there were no trees, and the sidewalk was white with moonlight. They stopped here and turned toward each other. Now it was a cool night with that mysterious excitement in it which comes as the two changes of the year. The quiet lights in the houses were humming out into the darkness, and there was a stir and bustle among the stars. Out of the corner of his eye, Gatsby saw that the blocks of the sidewalks really formed a ladder and mounted to a secret place above the trees. He could climb to it if he climbed alone, and once there he could suck on the path of life, gulp down the incomparable milk of wonder. His heart beat faster and faster as Daisy's white face came up to his own. He knew that when he kissed this girl and forever wed his unutterable, unutterable visions to her perishable breath, his mind would never romp again like the mind of God. So he waited listening for a moment longer to the tuning fork that had been struck upon a star. Then he kissed her. At his lips' touch, she blossomed for him like a flower, and the incarnation was complete. Through all he said, even through his appalling sentimentality, I was reminded of something, an elusive rhythm, a fragment of lost words that I'd heard somewhere a long time ago. For a moment, a phrase tried to take shape in my mouth, and my lips parted like a dumb man's, as though there was more struggling upon them than a wisp of startled air. But they made no sound, and what I had almost remembered was uncommunicable forever. Fantastic. Thank you so much again, Eduardo. Um, Matthew, please talk to me about the power of Fitzgerald's approximation of feeling when hearing that passage. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a really, I mean, that passage, which is, which is just, um, you know, perfection and, 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 but it's also a, a, a strange kind of perfection because it's, it's a perfection that, that, um, you know, is, is really about, you know, a kind of imperfection <laughs> of, of, of human experience and, and of, of, of young human experience. Right. I mean, it, that's a, that's a passage that, means a lot more to me now that I'm older. <laughs> Perfect example of a, of a, of a, of a passage that, that would not have been nearly so legible to me when I was younger um, or when anyone is younger, because it's, you know, because it's really about the, the unrecoverable, unrecoverable and unattainable nature of, um, you know, one's first idealized love. Yeah, sure. And, you know, and, and that the, 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 the kind of central power of this book is, is how, um, you know, I mean, that's what the book's about, right? At its, right. its core, it's, 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 you know, at its, at its intimate and emotional core, that's what it's about. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that Fitzgerald did, we mentioned Geneva King, and uh, he did apparently try to, you know, her marriage, she married someone else. The person that she married was apparently the model or a model for Tom Buchanan. And then the marriage ended much later than this, right? I think after 
after yeah. Gatsby and Fitzgerald tried to reunite with her and I guess it didn't really work out. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, the, the wonderfulness of this passage is that it, it feels like it, it, um, it, it doubles and then redoubles that, you know, it would be one thing if, if it stopped with Gatsby realizing that his idealized love is going to, is going to somehow die or be transformed the moment that he takes any kind of possession of it. But then it, 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 it moves to Nick's, you know, struggling with something that he finds inexpressible. Yeah. So yeah. that, so that it takes this, this, um, this, you know, very difficult and very kind of sophisticated uh, understanding adult, you know, of, of, of experience and then um, complicates it even further. You know, it's, it's astonishing that he wrote that passage when he was as young as he was. Yeah. And we have to keep that in mind, you know, how old, how old was he when he wrote the great Gatsby? He was, in his 20s. Yeah, early, yeah, mid 20s. Yeah. So the poet Edna St. Vincent Millay and the literary critic Edmund Wilson both thought that Fitzgerald was a great stylist and had a very vivid imagination, but that he did not have any intellectual ideas to express and that his work lacked substance. What are your thoughts about these opinions? Um, that those two didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> um, and and uh, really, I, I, I mean that almost literally, that, that mm -hmm. They don't what they don't what what they're struggling with. And I think what what people struggled with here is that, um, you know, to write about class <laughs> is one thing. <laughs> um, and obviously other writers, you know, within the American grain and tradition had done it um, sure. to write about it with the kind of unembarrassed yearning mm -hmm. <laughs> that Fitzgerald invites into his book. You know, this is a very different thing than. Mm -hmm. Uh, Wharton or James, right? You know, people that had, that had come before and that had written about about class in in American life because they were they were writing about it um, cr critically or stringently, but also from the perspective of people who had money from the inside. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And I think that people who were, you know, people the the, the response that Malay and and and, and uh, Wilson, you know, that they had no ideas. Um, I mean, um, first of all, no one. <laughs> Could read even that passage that I that, that that Eduardo just read and and be convinced that there were no ideas in the in the manuscript. It's it's shorthand. I think it's a shorthanded way of saying, oh, um, um, you know, this is a callow book or mm -hmm. or a book um, about young people. Um, and I, I would also argue that it is impossible to be a great stylist and not have ideas. I agree with that. <laughs> that, I that, style agree. Is, that style really, really developed literary style of Fitzgerald's kind is itself, um, yeah. you know, uh, an embodiment of, of ideas. I agree. And I, I often don't like that dichotomy. I think it's sort of a false, honestly, uh, dichotomy of one or the other. It's I, I think that style is substance oftentimes. Yeah, quite. Um, so we'll be taking questions soon for Matthew. Please start sending them in. Um, yeah. A couple have come in, but before we get to them, I want to ask you a final question. Yeah. Fitzgerald, as we said earlier, died very young. Yeah. He was only 40. Had he lived uh, 44? Had he lived a very long life? Where do you think his work uh, would have gone? And how do you think the 21st century would have reacted to him? You, you know, ever? it's very hard to say because I, I do think that, you know, the last tycoon, and this may just be because I like it so much, but I do think if he had really succeeded in finishing, if, if he had finished that book, um, that it might have, uh, you know, stood up for him as a, as a second masterpiece. And I think would have um, rescued him from, uh, you know, certainly from the kind of oblivion that he was, that he was then living in. Um, I, you know, I think that there's a, the established mythology of Fitzgerald's life is that you know, he he went to Hollywood, um, wrote a bunch of hack screenplays and died, you know, in, in destitution. And he certainly was um, quite, you know, pretty broke by the time he he expired. But um, but I think that he he you know, he, he wasn't right working cynically out there at all. He was he was out there trying to trying to figure out, um, you know, because he loved the movies <laughs> and he wanted to write for the movies. And I think, you know, and I think you know, many of Fitzgerald's gifts for the same reason that his, that his work has proven so difficult to adapt. Um, you know, uh, you know, which is to say it's, it's psychological complication and it's kind of, kind of 
um, you know, incredibly sophisticated movement around point of view. It's the same, you know, it's, which I think is very akin to what makes Henry James so great and so hard to adapt as well. Um, right. You know, so it's, I, 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 I certainly wouldn't, you know, prognosticate, oh, he would have risen like a phoenix from the ashes of his obscurity. I don't think that's true. But I do think that, you know, that he had more productive writing in him that he would have gone on to do. Um, sure. I agree with that. You know, it would have been, would have been nice to have more of that. Before we get to the questions, Eduardo, please come back uh, to read the conclusion of The Great Gatsby for us. Most of the big shore places were closed now, and there were hardly any lights except the shadowy moving glow of a ferry boat across the sound. And as the moon rose higher, the inessential houses began to melt away, till gradually I became aware of the old island here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes, a fresh green breast of the new world. Its vanished trees, the trees that had made way for Gatsby's house, had once pandered in whispers to the last and greatest of all human dreams. For a transitory, enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, compelled into an aesthetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired, face to face for the last time in history with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. And as I sat there brooding on the old unknown world, I thought of Gatsby's wonder when he first picked out the green light at the end of Daisy's dock. He had come a long way to this blue lawn, and his dream must have seemed so close that he could hardly fail to grasp it. He did not know that it was already behind him, somewhere back in that vast obscurity beyond the city, where the dark fields of the Republic rolled on under the night. Gatsby believed in the green light, the orgastic future that year by year recedes before us. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch out our arms farther, and one fine morning, so we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Beautiful. Thank you, Eduardo, so much for those five passages. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Magnificently read. Um, to that point of the green light, the first question that comes up. Matthew, can you discuss the symbolism of the green light? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, you know, it's such a it is such a remarkable, it's such an immaculate image. And I, I just have to say again, too, just to, to double on what you just said. Um, Eduardo, hearing you read this book makes me feel like I'm, I, I just want nothing more than to hear all of it from you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, it was really magnificent. Um, I, you know, um, I don't, I am always a little reluctant to, and, and this is not at all to, to, to um, you know, push against the question, which I think is a great question. And I'm always, but I'm always reluctant to the term symbolism because it, well, mostly because it brings back memories of English class and, you know, the way that books are sometimes taught as, you know, uh, Easter egg hunts for, for a, um, for, you know, for, for a writer's real meaning, right. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, you know, the, where the, the, you know, the green, what is the green light? The green light is, is a green light. Um, but it is an incredible, it is an incredible image. Right. And, right. and I think, you know, one certainly, um, the, uh, the novel's handling of color throughout is kind of is itself. I'm sure this has been written about at great length, but mm -hmm. you know, I always think about a moment where he talks about the, you know, the afternoon being like the wild blue Mediterranean honey or something. And you're just like, well, I don't even know what that means, but it's so <laughs> vivid. And obviously the green light is, is one of the most famous and indelible uh, images in the entire book. And, and I think, you know, it's, it is, it is, uh, you know, uh, this is going to make me sound like an idiot, but I think, so. you know, I've always kind of associated it with the, you know, just like almost like a traffic light color. You know, if it were a red light, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be inviting him. Mm -hmm. But a green light says, you know, says. Summoning. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a kind of summons. And yeah. honestly, I, um, maybe unconsciously, I chose a green shirt to wear for this. <laughs> I honestly didn't do it intentionally. Uh, yeah. I just realized now uh, how synchronous that was. Yeah. Um, but, 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 I, but I think the book, the book is, you know, because the book is so much about, you know, the, the, 
the, the way that we are pulled forward by our desires and by our hopes and by the kind of, you know, the, the promise of, you know, the mirage like promise of, of, of something that's, you know, that's, that's going to reward us, you know, some great, some yeah. great resolution. Um, yeah. that, that's yeah. what that, that's what that light is for, for Gatsby. It's him, it's him, you know, it's, it's the moment that we behold him beholding the thing that's calling to him. Brian, I was I was actually hoping to ask something. I'm going to put myself in a bit of an audience member role yeah. for a second. At the top of the show, I, you know, you talked about the journey of how the book was sort of obscure when it came out. Then it, in World War II, it was given to soldiers and then eventually made its way into high school curriculums and so became this classic. Uh, and now it has taken yet another uh, turn. And at the top of the show, it was announced, I guess, that it's uh, QPL's banned book month. Uh -huh. And I noticed in the graphic that there's Gatsby, you know, in the middle of banned yeah. books. Yep. Yeah. We've gone from, you know, this tiny little obscure thing that didn't do well to this classic to banned book. And I was yeah. hoping, uh, uh, Matt, you, you could speak to this. Like, how did this get here? Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> boy. Um, I know, that's a big one. Yeah, it's a big one. And it's also, you know, I, I'm, 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 I actually have not read anywhere about, about the, you know, the banning of Gatsby, although at this point I feel like they'll ban almost anything for almost any reason, right? Sure, sure. Um, and and I think you know, the, the, if if anything, the 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 hostility is not specific. It's obviously not specific to Gatsby. It's a, it's 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 more of a hostility towards um, books and literature in general, right? <laughs> that we're that we're confronting at the moment. Yeah, oh, for sure. And uh, Edward, I'm happy that you brought that up. And uh, you know, this is we are entering into Ban Books Week. Yeah. Uh, we, Public Library has uh, a link that we'll put into the chat section pretty soon, the comment section pretty soon, actually, that um, will help you review all 100 of the most requested banned books in the QPL system Yeah, uh, to celebrate Banned Books Week. I love the idea that we're now, like, reclaiming it. You know, it, it's, yeah. like, it's actually a, a thing to aspire to as a writer. I hope my books get banned. Because sure. I mean, you know, what what aspires to, you know, I mean, what is what is it, right? That the, the job is to comfort to comfort the afflicted and, and afflict the comfortable. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it is it is a sign of literature doing its work. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's pushing you know, so, the right buttons, I think. So I think, yeah. So speaking of pushing the right buttons, you alluded earlier to the um, the crack up and yeah. some of the potentially racial overtones. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit more about this, this dream that black people were harming him that he had, that he had written about in that book? Can you? Yeah, well, um, I, again, I, I just tried to look up that passage a little bit before, and I, I wasn't finding a, a passage where he talked about black people harming him. There is a passage where he talks about, you know, how he, he, that's the passage I alluded to where he says, I, I, you know, I grew up with only the most vague, racial prejudices and and during the period during the period of his crack up um i found and he he but he he, he says that you know i i couldn't be around black people celts like he he just lumps in a uh, he, he he names a bunch of um you know different identities um that that rendered him uncomfortable i do think that if we wanted to just talk about it in gatsby you know there are um almost to know black people in Gatsby, but it, but there is a, a, a crucial passage that I think, that I think is, you know, fairly racist where he's talking about driving on the, on the bridge and he sees, um, you know, a, another car come by that has, you know, sort of wealthy young, and he, he refers to them as bucks, which is a really terrible, um, you know, term, you know, it's, 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 it's a, it's an apparitional moment. And it, it pretty much squares with the fact that, you know, that that uh, and again, even if you write this off as as Nick Carraway's uh, vantage point and not the author's, you know, um, again, I sort of feel like sort of saying I grew up with only vague racial prejudices is basically saying, like, I grew up only a little racist. Right. And, you know, that, that that that's how it is. I mean, I will also say, you know, this is certainly not my thesis. It seems a little um, academic for me. But, you know, there have also been I have seen bandied about the theory that, you know, that, that, you know, was Gatsby black, you know, <laughs> like, I, I think that there have been people wow. who have tried to put forth a, 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 a theory that the book is really about passing, um, wow. which is itself, um, which again, seems a little wild, but I think speaks to the, 
to the you know elasticity and 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 complexity of the text that anyone would even would even conjure that theory. Sure. And then Nella Larson's passing would be yeah. Yeah. Theory, right? yeah. the early, in the late twenties. Um, there's a, a comment here. Yeah. Uh, Eduardo never disappoints, no matter the subject. I first heard him read yeah. "The Speaks the Nightbird" in the Matthew Corbett series. As my vision wanes, I'm more and more happy for that discovery. It's very nice. Yeah, I I, I have to say I am. Um, my my this is a minor tangent but my my um my stepbrother my sorry my brother-in-law does a lot of audio audio work as well he's not as prolific as as you are eduardo but he he was the one who who you know he was he's he's he just was like the great eduardo ballerini the gold standard <laughs> that was very kind oh, that's, that's great um so before we wrap up i'm just eager to learn what you're both working on what are your next projects if you could talk about them. Sure, Eduardo, you go first. <laughs> uh, sure, uh, so I continue uh, working uh, with recordings. Uh, I have some uh, some exciting titles coming up. I'm always hesitant to say what they are because I have this sort of jinx theory yeah. of things. Uh, I do, uh, uh, I'm gonna be in a new TV series uh, called uh, Retreat for FX that'll be out next year. Uh, and I also have a few writing projects, believe it or not. Um, last year, I was fortunate to co-create something with Jess Walter, mm -hmm. uh, the wonderful author, and that has opened the door to some other possible co-creations of works uh, as audio originals. So it's kind of a new venture for me and a new sphere, but it's a very exciting space to be in to actually create some of the material. So yeah, that's fantastic. That's, that's really yeah. Jess, Thank you. Please keep, keep me posted. On I will, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And Matthew. You just um, you're finished. Book, I right? am, yeah. I'm just um, in the sort of uh, deep stages of, of finishing um, a, a memoir called "The Golden Hour," um, which is a, um, about uh, my my family and their passage through the motion picture business, um, and really about the motion picture business itself and how its kind of rise and fall in the late 20th century um, mirrors the rise and fall of, of American empire. Um, so my yeah, my dad's. Um, first job in the 50s was working for Lou Wasserman, who <laughs> the, the man who created Ronald Reagan, really, um, you know, it, it sort of wow. took him from being a, a failed screen actor to being a, a you know, um, a, a household presence. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so it's it's a it's a kind of sprawling and wild story. Only some of it is some of it is very personal and some of it is much wider than that. We do a beautiful job marrying the the personal with the the historical and the socio political, as you did when always crashing in the same car. Thank you. Uh, great, yeah. great marriage of cultural criticism and memoir. Um, thank you both so much this evening for your time and your insights and your talents. And thank you everybody for uh, tuning in. And you can learn more about Matthew Spector and Eduardo Ballerini and Band Books Week by checking out the links in the comments section. Have a good evening, thank everybody. Guys. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Good night. Bye.